If you just got an Air 2S, today I wanna to show you how to set it up, take it out, get ready for your first flight, and then some of the best settings you can use for your first flight and the settings that I use for filming and photography with the Air 2S. First things first, if you just got it, you wanna pull it out of the bag, and there are stickers all over the drone, plus there are no props attached. So you wanna take these little foam pieces off, and then you wanna go through and take each one of the stickers off, being careful not to uh, leave any residue on your drone. To unfold the drone and to take this off, what you wanna do is unfold each of these two, the tops are the ones with the antennas, the ones with the antennas on there off. And then there are a couple of stickers right here. I'm gonna pull those off. Unfold each of the bottom legs. And then there are a couple of stickers right here. I'm gonna pull those stickers off. If you pull the stickers off nice and slow, you should have no problems getting them off without leaving any residue or bits and pieces. You're gonna open this little door here. There's a little sticker here you wanna pull off. It protects the SD card. Protects the SD card uh, space in there. And then there's also a little sticker right here, which is protecting the, um, which protects the USB-C. Pull that off and then close that little door up. These little doors just push in and close up like that. All right, so now the stickers are off the outside of the drone. You wanna pull the gimbal off, put your finger here, pull toward the front of the drone, and then the whole gimbal should just pop up and off like that. There is a sticker here on the very back side of the gimbal, so you wanna pull that off. Gently. And there's a sticker here that goes around the gimbal arm, and here does the same thing. Get both of those off. And now the drone is sticker free and ready to start charging the batteries for the first time. So we're gonna just plug these in, get them charging. For now, we're gonna put the gimbal guard back on. So it's push it around the gimbal cover, just like that. Clip it into the front top right up here and then push down right there where your finger goes right there. You just push that down until it kind of latches in place. That holds the gimbal nice and steady. Never wanna fly with the gimbal on or start up with the gimbal on because it won't let the gimbal calibrate the way that it needs to be. You push the button, there's no charge on the battery. One of the ways to activate and turn the batteries on for the first time is to charge them and you wanna charge them up fully before we do the very first binding to the drone and checking the firmware. You also wanna pull the remote controller out. We're gonna take it out of this bag. Wanna charge everything up. The remote controller should come already bound to the drone, but if it doesn't, I will show you how to bind it or if you're gonna to bind to something else. There's a sticker right there around this USB-C cable. And that's pretty much it for the remote controller on the drone. It does come with about half of a charge, but we're gonna go ahead and plug it in and charge it the rest of the way. Your propellers are in this black box labeled accessories. We're gonna open this up. This is also where the charger is. You've got your charger, charger here, cable to plug it in your extra two extra batteries, your two extra batteries, if you got the fly more kit, and then this little device, which actually turns the batteries into a little USB power pack. In this big wide flat box labeled accessories, this is where your propellers are, as well as some of the other cables, things that you're gonna want. Here you have all your propellers, which if you get the fly more kit, you get quite a few. Now you'll notice, You'll notice that some of them have an orange ring on them right here, and some of them are just black. So you want two of each. So an orange and a black, and an orange and a black. We'll set those aside. I'm gonna keep the rest of these in here. This here, these are your ND filters. If you got the Fly More kit, which I definitely am going to use. You can open them up. You open them up. They're nicely packed in there. I like this nice thin case to be able to take with me places. And then in here, if you use something other than an iOS device, you have a USB-C to USB mini or micro and a USB-C to USB-C. So if you use an Android phone, these are the cables you're gonna wanna switch out with. And they go, they're located right in the front of the controller here. And then you have a USB-A to USB-C for charging and an extra pair of control sticks. 
In the Flymore kit, you get this three battery charger here, which is really handy. It is a sequential charger, so it will only charge one battery at a time. But as you charge one and as it's completely charged, it will then switch automatically to the next, which it is really handy to be able to charge three batteries without having to switch them yourself. Basically, the charger plugs in here, like so, and then each battery will plug in like so. To take the batteries on and off the drone, you squeeze this side bit here and then plug them in. Now, we're gonna go plug this in and get it charging. And we're also gonna plug in the, U the controller and start it charging via the USB-C port here. While those are charging, it'll take a little while, so we're gonna go ahead and put the propellers on and prepare this drone for our first flight. Pull the propeller out. And this is really important. You see the little orange circle? You wanna match up to the, the motor arm that has the orange pieces around it. So that way you know that the rotation direction is gonna be correct. And you basically put it on like that, push down, and then twist until it locks in place. Same thing with this. Put it in, line up the tabs with the holes, push down, and then turn and lock it in place. Again, same thing, push down, and you can't go the wrong direction, so if you can't twist it very far, then you wanna go the other way and lock it in place. And last one, push down, lock it in place. There we go. Batteries are charging, controller's charging. We're gonna come back in a little bit, make sure that we've activated the drone and that the firmware is up to date before we go out to do our first flight. It took a while, but everything is charged. So unfold your drone. Again, top two out first, bottom two back next. The battery in, clip it down so it clicks nice and steady. Thumb, pull the gimbal color cover off. And then with the remote, you wanna push, push and push and hold. Turn the remote on, push and push and hold. Turn the drone on. The way to insert your phone is pull this out. You wanna pull the cable out here and pull it around so you can attach it in a minute. Put your phone in by pushing that part forward and then snapping it into the remote controller. Plug the cable in to whichever device you might have. It should open up the DJI Fly app automatically, but it doesn't all the time. From here, if you've never activated your drone before, you don't have a DJI account, you need to create a DJI account, activate the drone by following the prompts on the app It'll log into your DJI account, activate the drone, and then once that's done, takes just a minute, you should be able to come here and see if there are any firmware updates. As you can see right here, we've got one, so you can hit update and it will update the drone automatically. Sometimes it does take a while, just put the drone aside and let it update um, until it's done and then we'll be ready to go fly. So I'll see you outside. So if you followed all the directions I've given you so far, you should have been able to clean everything off, get all the stickers off, and you've activated. Make sure you update your drone before you come out to a location like this where there's no cell signal, and then get ready for your first flight. Now I'm gonna take you through the app, all of the settings that are in the app, and then also the settings that I use and the setup that I use for getting the best and the most uh, performance out of this little drone. We'll go over the remote controller real quick, just so you're familiar with it. Here on this side on the top, you have the function button. I'll show you how to program that in a little bit. Here you have the pause and return to home button. So if you tap it once, if you're flying in intelligent flight mode, the drone will stop immediately. And if you double tap it, it will come back and initiate its return to home point function where it took off from. Right here, you have your battery display. You have a cine mode, normal mode, and sport mode. If you've not flown drones before, start in cine mode because everything is slower and more precise and more controlled. Normal mode's the in-between, but obstacle avoidance still works, and sport mode is fast as you can go and no obstacle avoidance is working. Then you have a power button. This button will switch between uh, photo mode and video mode, so if you need to switch quickly to take a photo and then switch back to video mode that's how you do that there and here on the front right here we have a dial which controls your gimbal rotation and then here you have your start your shutter button which starts and stops recording and uh, or will take a photo so before we take off you want to familiar yourself familiarize yourself with the screen here starting in the upper left hand corner you have end mode which tells you what mode the drone is flying in c is for cine which is slow and steady sort of flying end mode is the normal mode obstacle avoidance still works and then sport mode is everything's as fast as possible, but obstacle avoidance does not work. So that's important to remember. 
Uh, it would start in cine mode or C mode or N mode. If you're uncomfortable with flying, you haven't flown drones much, then start in C mode and get used to the drone flying from there. Next to that, you have a message that tells you if you're in a restricted zone or not. Important to pay attention to those. And then coming across the top right side, you have the battery voltage level or the level of battery you have left at 97% right now. We're doing fine. The green circle indicates overall how much battery you have and how much time you can fly in just anywhere as far as away, as far away as you want dare to go. Uh, the further away you get though, the more you will see that there's a yellow part of the circle that will come up. That is your critical return to home point where the drone needs to start heading back. Otherwise, it may not have enough battery time or battery life to get all the way back to you. And then the red, the drone will start to land automatically. So you can keep an eye on your drone uh, battery there. And then next to that is a timer. That gives you an estimated amount of flight time you have left. So you can keep an eye on there and know that, you know, if you're out a ways and you might want to start heading back as soon as you start getting around the yellow. An important thing to keep in mind is if you're flying, away from yourself and with the wind when you turn around to come back it's going to take more battery power to get back to you so if you're flying back into a headwind give yourself extra time and extra battery power to get back there and then next to that is the rc link which tells you how strong your connection is between you and the drone also if obstacle avoidance is active or not right now it is and then how many gps satellite locks you have you want to make sure you have a good lock and it tells you that it's, it's in the white so that you know you've got a good lock because if the drone, something happens where you lose control link, the drone will do an auto return to wherever that home point is set. And the more satellites you have, the more accurate that home point is. And then we're gonna move down across the lower, lower side. Here, in this little arrow you can turn on and off. That's safety assistance mode, which means uh, your sideways flight is disabled or enabled if it, since it doesn't have obstacle avoidance on the sides. If you're not comfortable with flying around things that maybe you might run into, you can disable sideways flight so you don't accidentally run into anything. And then below that, you have a takeoff, an auto takeoff function, which will take the drone off the ground and then hover about 18 inches or two feet above the ground. Underneath that, we have the map. Now the map shows you where you are, your flight path that the drone has taken always shows you where your drone is and where your home point is. So if you ever get disoriented, you can turn on the map and and figure out what, where you are and what direction you need to go in order to get back to you, back to your home point. Now we're back in here. Next to the maps, you have your height, how high it is, and just above that, how fast you're, you're ascending or descending. And then next to that is how far away from your home point you've gone, as well as how fast your forward or your speed is, how fast the drone's traveling. Coming across the bottom, you have your storage, how much storage is left on your SD card or the internal storage, depending on what you're using, and then also what your current resolution and frame rate is and your balance. Now, if you change this little camera button here from auto to pro, you get all of the options. So you can change your uh, resolution here. You can change your white balance here or set it on auto. You can change your shutter speed here or set it on auto. I always lock my shutter speed to two times my frame rate because that gives you the most natural looking motion blur. And then you can change your ISO or set it on auto. As one of the nice things about this drone is it gives you a little bit finer level of control over your image. And then coming up the side here, you have a play button where if you tap that, it will go into media that's already been recorded by the drone that's on the SD card on the drone. So if you want to download any specific photos or clips, you can. Of course, you have your start, stop recording or your shutter button there. And then just above that, we get into some of the features of the drone. Right now we're in video mode, so you can do normal or slow motion. Slow motion will shoot 1080p up to 120 frames a second. I don't shoot in slow motion very often. But you can shoot in normal mode, you can shoot in 4K up to 60 frames a second, which then you can slow down a little bit if you want a little slow motion in post. Above that, we have photo mode, which gives you a single shot. The smart photo mode, which actually does a really good job. Auto exposure bracketing, which means it'll take three to five photos and then combine them to give you kind of a high dynamic range. Useful if you're doing things in really high contrast areas where you have really dark shadows and really bright highlights. Burst, where it'll take a few different shots uh, over a time period, so you can get maybe some high fast action stuff in a couple of different exposures. And then time shot. So if you want to put the drone up and have it just take a photo every five seconds for as long as it's in the air, you can use that there. In order to get into master shots or quick shots, we're going to take the drone off for the first time. So two ways to do that. You can either pull both of your control sticks 
down into the center, which will start the motors, and then you take off by pushing up on the left stick. Or you can use the auto takeoff feature, which you tap and then push and hold. And as soon as you let go, the drone will take off. So now that we've taken off, we can enter the master shots where it will perform a set of pre-programmed shots with obstacle avoidance on, but remember, no side obstacle avoidance, so you wanna make sure it's not low and around a lot of side obstacles that it could run into. Uh, basically, you would turn, select your subject, and push start, and it will start to perform all of the different shots. Um, you can select how wide or how far away you want it to go. If you want it to stay a little closer to you or much closer to you, you can do that. You can decide how, uh, how far away the length, how, how, how much away forward to backward you want it to be able to go. And then you can also select how high you want it to go. If you want it to do high, medium, or really high, you can select all those there. And then the current location is the starting point and we can hit go and it will start recording at 4k the master shots and then put together a little edited bit for us as well as the full length file by default these all come on 1080p so you can change your resolution down here and then uh, you're ready to go i record everything in 4k or 5.4k if i'm using it manually just because i want the most amount of resolution possible but if your computer is older you struggle to edit 4k then drop down to 2.7 or 1080p and you should be fine. Under master shots, we have quick shots, and this is where we have all the options for droney, rocket, circle, helix, boomerang, or asteroid. And as you select each one of these, there may be options that pop up for how far away, how high you want the drone to be able to go. Um, I usually stick to 200 feet or less because that seems to be about right. And it's the same as with master shots. You can select your target, hit start and the drone will start to perform whatever that pre-programmed intelligent flight mode is. And then we have hyperlapse mode where the drone will fly a predetermined flight path and take a picture every whatever you set your interval to be. So here you can change your interval to be three to five, to whatever seconds you want. Uh, you can set how long you want the hyperlapse to be, say like 10 seconds. And then you can set how fast you want the drone to be able to fly. You don't need to fly very fast because remember, this whole thing is gonna be really sped up when you get done. And then when you're ready to go, you can hit the record button and the drone will start going. Uh, you can do a free hyperlapse, which basically means you can turn and control the drone as it's performing the hyperlapse. You can do a circle where you set a point of interest and it will circle around. Or you can do course lock where the drone will try and fly a straight line, but if there's wind, it may push the drone around a little bit. Or you can set waypoints where it will go from an A point to a B point, which includes altitude, left, right, turn, everything else. So if you wanna get a certain, a uh, little more precise control over your hyperlapse, then the waypoint mode is actually a really great way to shoot hyperlapses. And below that, we come to the different smart photo modes, which is a sphere 360 degree photo, 180 degree really wide panorama, a wide angle photo, which gives you a whole bunch of information right around your subject, and a vertical panorama, if that's something you wanted to record as well. Up on the upper right-hand side, there are three little dots. If you tap those, that'll bring up the in-depth menu, which starts on the safety page. So here at the top, you can decide how you want it to respond to any obstacle. You can have it just stop, have obstacle avoidance off if you want, or have it bypass. It'll try and find a flight path around that obstacle. If you enable bypass, you can tell it to disable or enable sideways flight. If you disable it, then it will probably just stop or try and go under or over the obstacle. But if you leave sideways flight on, it'll find a, try and find a flight path around it. But if there's a lot of things to the side, you wanna be careful with that, like I said before. Down in the flight protection section, you can set the max altitude. I have it set to the max because I'm constantly flying around and in mountains, and it's very easy to run out of space. It's important to maintain and obey the rules wherever you live. Here in the US, you're supposed to say 400 feet above ground level. The app records the takeoff point as ground level, so as I'm flying up the side of a mountain, I can run out of 1,600 feet really fast, but still be well within 400 feet of ground level. For distance, you can set it to be whatever distance you want. Uh, 
I set it to max, but honestly, you can't see this drone much further than a half mile, if you can even see it at a half mile, depending on the background. So that's up to you. Always fly safe and obey the rules. And then here is important where you set your auto return to home function. Uh, you can set it as high or as low as you want. I find around 150 feet is good. If this is metric, you can figure out that's about 30 meters. Um, most of the stuff I fly around is not higher than 150 feet because we don't have really huge trees. But if you have big trees or big houses, big buildings, you wanna make sure you set that to be a little bit higher than whatever the highest object is you're gonna be flying around. Now, if you've moved a long way or you're flying from a boat or something that's moving, you wanna update your home point periodically so that the drone doesn't return to where you are no longer. Uh, and this is where you do that. You can update the home point, you hit okay. It gives you an updated home point confirmation. Here is where your compass and your IMU, if you ever need to calibrate them or something's going weird, you can calibrate each one of those. The IMU, I don't recommend calibrating unless the app tells you to. Same with the compass, but the compass will tell you to calibrate periodically if you've traveled a great distance from the last place you flew. Down here, you can find your battery info, how many times you've flown, what the voltages are, what the temperatures are. The temperatures are important if you're flying in cold weather. Make sure you start flying and get the battery temp up to around 20 C before you really start flying in cold weather. And then it also gives you serial number and the amount of times your battery has been charged. Below that, we have a, the auxiliary LED. You can turn it on to automatic where it, as it comes down to land, it'll turn it on automatically. Helpful if you're flying in lower light situations, sunsets, dusk. You can also just turn it on or just turn it off. I leave it on auto and it does a good job. Unlocked GeoZone is where if you've applied for permission to fly in an area that's a locked a lock zone, you can deal with the code when you've gotten the unlock from DJI, you've sent them all the paperwork from FAA or whoever your governing body is, and then uh, you can put the license here from uh, your DJI account. Find your drone. We saw that on the map earlier, but this is another area where you can find it there, uh, and you can make it flash and beep there as well. And then advanced safety settings. That deals with if you push uh, both sticks down to the center, the drone motors will stop and it will drop like a rock. That's useful in emergency. If a small airplane comes out of nowhere all of a sudden, you gotta get out of the way. You also designate what you want it to do if it loses signal, return to home, descend, or hover. And then you can turn air sense on or off. Uh, I keep mine off for right now because there's a lot of small airplanes flying around. It will constantly be warning me but um, I'm aware of them, I know where they are, I keep an eye on it and I'm careful, so I turn mine off. But if you are flying for the first time, turn it on, it uh, works really well. And down at the very bottom is aeroscope, and a lot of that it really isn't being utilized yet, but as more and more of remote ID or other things like that in other countries come out, that's where you're gonna be entering information there that you might need to broadcast to be able to comply with your local regulations. The control tab, here's where you can select if you want it in metric via meters, metric via kilometers, or imperial. You can have it scan for subjects uh, where it will automatically detect people or subjects that you, it thinks you might wanna record. You can also select between follow me mode and FPV mode. FPV mode is where the gimbal will tilt as you turn or rotate sideways to give you more of that kind of flying through FPV feeling. I use follow me mode, it keeps the horizon level and gives you that really smooth, stable footage. If you wanna be able to tilt the gimbal up, which is useful if you're gonna start a shot below something and come up around it, then you turn the gimbal upper, upper gimbal rotation on here. You can also calibrate the gimbal here where it can go through an auto calibration process. And you can go into the advanced gimbal settings. Uh, I found that the default settings on this are actually pretty good. In the past, I had to change a lot of them, but between 12 and 15 is usually where my pitch speed ends up. Uh, for smoothness, which is how long it takes the gimbal to stop when you let off the, the change. Uh, eight to 10 is usually where I end up. And for yaw, the gimbal will turn left and right. You can set the yaw speed where you want it and the yaw smoothness. I don't change those. I don't yaw the gimbal that much, which means you turn it from left to right because you can get props in the view or the leg in the view. Um, and that's all in the normal modes. When you go into cine mode, the cine mode on the controller or smooth mode, the pitch speed goes down. 10, pitch smooth is 15, which means it takes longer for it to stop. You want a really smooth stop to the end. 
and the yaw speed and yaw smoothness goes down as well. In sport mode, obviously everything's faster. You want everything to be faster. 30 is pretty good. I usually end up in about 24 to 25. Pitch smoothness, basically as soon as I stop moving the gimbal, I want it to stop, so I've left that at zero. You might find between zero and five is pretty good for that. And then yaw speed and yaw smoothness is much higher as well. If you ever need to reset those to the default settings, you can hit the reset down there at the bottom. And if your gimbal is somewhere and you want to recenter it, you can hit recenter to the gimbal. It will go down to the bottom, or if you hit it again, it'll come back up to the zero point and uh, right off the bottom, or where the horizon is directly in the middle. Right below that, we have uh, some controls for the remote controller. Now, if you operate in cold temperatures with your phone, turning phone charging on will help your phone tremendously last a lot longer in cold temperatures. Or if you have an older battery in your phone and it doesn't last very long, that's a good thing to use. Stick mode, I fly mode two, but if you fly mode one or mode three, there you go. You can also customize it. Most people fly mode two, so I wouldn't mess with that. Here on the controller, we have this function button. Now, if you want to program that so that when you tap it once, it will do the recenter the gimbal. I use it in case I've like been shooting straight down and I want to get it back up quickly so I can fly forward, then I use that. And if you want to double tap it, then it gives you the option to, you can do a lot of other things. You can turn the LED on, toggle the map view, change the gimbal mode, get into your advanced camera settings. You can lock or unlock the auto exposure, which can be handy depending on the lighting conditions you're uh, operating in. Uh, let's see. I usually have that set to my advanced camera settings. So here also just below that, you can turn the aircraft off and then uh, and calibrate the remote control sticks. You can also do a flight tutorial where DJI will teach you about the basic controls. If you've never flown a drone before, it's a very good thing to do and I would go ahead and do it. And below that, if you need to relink or rebind, repair your aircraft with the remote, you can do it there. And then we're gonna to move to the camera settings, the advanced camera settings. Here, depending on the mode you're in, these settings will change. So right now we're in video mode. You can see that you can choose between MP4 and MOV for a container for the type of video we're shooting. D-Log, 10-bit color is what I normally shoot in, but if you're gonna do uh, the master shots and some of the other things, you have to change it to normal. Or if you wanna do the zoom in function here, HLG is another one. I don't use it that much, but it might be something you'd want to shoot in if you're matching a certain camera that shoots in HLG. Anti-flicker, if you're shooting around a lot of lights, you can turn that to auto. If you live in Europe and many Asian countries, you might want to put it on 50 hertz. If you live in the United States or North America, probably 60 hertz. Video subtitles, I don't ever use them, but if you want video subtitles, you can put them on. Histogram, Turns on where you can see how close you're overexposing or underexposing you are with your highlights and your shadows. You can turn on overexposure warning where you'll see these kind of zebras uh, against things that are being overexposed. And you can turn on and off all the grid lines and center point. Now I fly with the diagonal and the rule of thirds because it's useful for framing and some of the more manual type orbiting shots, things like that. Peaking level is if you have the autofocus set to manual and you want to see what's in focus, that will put red lines around everything that's in focus. And then white balance here, you can set it to auto or manual as well. And then below that, you have the storage location. I'm using my SD card, but you can also see the status of the internal storage or you can format the internal storage or the SD card. Cache video when recording means it's, it's storing a version of the video on your phone. So if something ever happens and you have some sort of backup, it stores it at 1080p, which is not bad. And then how much you want that cache to be able to take up, how much space you want to be able to take up on your phone. We're gonna to switch to photo mode real quick so I can show you some of those. Now you can see it shoots in JPEG or JPEG plus RAW. I always shoot in JPEG plus RAW for photos. I want the most amount of size and the most amount of detail and the most amount of information. RAW gives you that. You can shoot in 16 by 9 or 3 by 2. I shoot in 3 by 2 and if I want to crop it later, I'll crop it. Anti-flicker is the same. All the rest of these are the same all the way down for that. And we'll go back out of there. And then I want to go into master shots because there's a setting here in master shots that people have pointed out to me which has been very helpful. If you're having trouble with props in your shot when you're using master shots, you want to come down here and change it from obstacle avoidance in shooting mode to composition. And that will 
lessen the ability of the drone to use obstacle avoidance, but it will also make sure props don't get in your shot. And then in the master shots here, if you want to shoot an H.264, which is easier for older computers to edit, that's where you can select that as well. And then we come to the transmission tab. If you want it to be smooth, low latency, you can choose smooth. It'll give you a less resolution on your, your video feed on your phone or your device that you're using than the controller. Or you can choose it to be an HD, which gives you the full 1080p downlink from the drone. I use HD because I like to see it the best I can. You can select your different frequencies. Uh, I leave it in dual band and the drone will auto figure what it has the least amount of interference in the area you're flying. And then in channel mode, I always leave it on auto because again, the drone will scan the frequencies and find the area that has the least amount of interference. And then we get to the about tab. In the about tab, you can change the name of your drone if you want to. It tells you the model. It tells you the firmware. You can check for updates here if you want to. It tells you the remote controller firmware. It also tells you the fly safe database from DJI where it's okay to fly, where it's restricted to fly. You can check for updates there as well if you want. Um, Let's see, it tells you the app version. And then you could also get all of the serial numbers if you need to register and you need a serial number, you can get that information here. One thing that's been confusing for some people, it was a little confusing for me when I first started using uh, drones that worked with the DJI Fly app was how to use ActiveTrack. ActiveTrack has gone from a separate tab in the Fly app or in the DJI Go 4 app to being an integrated part of the app. So if you want to track something, all you have to do is draw a square around the subject you want to track. Then it gives you three options. The spotlight, which means you can basically fly the drone wherever you want to fly it. And it will uh, keep that subject in the center of the frame. Or you can use POI mode, where you can set it to uh, just circle your subject at a set speed. You can have it go faster, you can have it go slower, you can make it go the other way. And you can do active track with trace, which is like from the front or from behind in a straight line. Or you can do parallel from the side. And it's important to make sure those things do. So you select one of those, say trace and then hit go and now the drone is tracking that's how you use active track you have to be in a resolution of 4k or lower and a frame rate of 30 fps or lower and if you want to stop you hit stop and you can close out of the screen there so when you're shooting in a standard color profile if you don't want to color grade i recommend you use the standard color profile uh, and you want to use the zoom feature then it's right up here above the the af button which is the autofocus you tap on the screen to focus on something um, but if you want to zoom in, you hit that 1x, which turns it to 2x, and the 4x, if you're shooting in 4K, you can go up to 8x if you shoot in 1080. I don't. The 4x in 4K is okay. It's a little soft, so I don't use it much, but the 2x is actually pretty nice. I do use that. The 2x will give you a really nice parallax effect for when you're circling around something. Always be aware of what's around you so you don't run into something uh, sideways because there is no side obstacle avoidance on this drone. If you want to see other ways you can improve your drone videography and photography, click or tap right there. I put together a small playlist. As always, if you have questions, ask me in the comments below or join my live stream Wednesday nights from 4 p.m. Alaska time or 8 p.m. Eastern. I will see you again soon in the next video. Cheers. I hope I recorded that last bit. <laughs> that would suck if I wasn't recording.